Uh, yes. Okay, well, if you have your Bibles, we are in 1 Corinthians once again, chapter 5, and beginning with verse 11. When Paul wrote this letter to the church at Corinth, he was going through some difficulties, as was the church. And as he mentions throughout this letter, that's, that's part of the deal for Christianity, is difficulties. Jesus did say, if you follow me, there will be trouble, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Uh, we learned in past weeks that we are just jars of clay, imperfect vessels with this treasure inside. And we are groaning in these bodies, longing to be clothed with glory. That's part of the Christian life. That's part of getting old. We groan, we long for immortality, but that's who we are. And we are that way so that it will all be about God. All the glory will go to him. None will go to us. And as we look at the passage today, just an absolutely awesome passage that gets down to the very fundamental basics of what the church is and what the gospel is. Something we want to have a, a good grasp on. So chapter 5, verse 11 says this, Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men, but are made manifest to God, and I hope that we are made manifest also in your consciences. For we are not again commending ourselves to you, but are giving you an occasion to be proud of us, so that you'll have an answer for those who take pride in appearance and not in heart. If we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are of sound mind, it is for you. The first thing we see here today is our main goal as the church is to bring people to Christ. Is to persuade people of the truth and the reality of Jesus Christ. He says, therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men. It all begins with the fear of the Lord. By the way, the fear of the Lord is a biblical term. That does not mean cowering in fear of lightning bolts being chucked if you're doing something wrong. Fear of the Lord is standing in awe of who he is. It's seeing him as he is. And when you see God as he is, he is a consuming fire. He is God. He is not just this, this guy in the sky with a beard and white hair. He is the God who created the universe by a word of his mouth, and he is not to be trifled with. The fear of the Lord is understanding that, understanding God is who he is, and because of that, there's nothing else you could ever do to make sense of your life but honor him, worship him, obey him. And what he's commanded us to do is persuade men of his reality. So Paul says, therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men and are manifest to God. It's God is the one who sees us. We don't do what we do to impress people. We don't do what we do to be popular. We have an audience of one that we serve, and that is God. And he is the one we stand before. It is to him that we will give account. We can fool people. Fooling people is so easy. It is so easy, and it's done all the time. You don't fool God. We stand before him and says, therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men. It is God whom we seek to please. And we do all we do for the sake of the gospel. It's amazing as you go through the letters to Corinth. 1 Corinthians, we looked at last year, 2 Corinthians this year. Most of what he tells them to do is for the sake of the gospel. Why does he talk about spiritual gifts and go into such detail about the gift of tongues and public service in chapter 14? For the sake of the gospel. He says, if you've got that gift in your own privacy of home, let it fly. But when you're together in public, be sober-minded. Be restrained for the sake of the gospel. It's why he tells the ladies to have their heads covered. It was for the sake of the gospel. That would go against everything he talked about in Galatians, about the freedom we have in Christ, no longer under the law, and then say, oh, by the way, there's one Christian law, ladies have to wear certain things. No, huh, that doesn't make sense. For the sake of the gospel. He said in talking about meat sacrifice to idols, if it's going to cause a problem, I will never eat meat again. For the sake of the gospel. Everything we are called to do as Christians, everything we are called to give up, or alter in any way, is for the sake of the gospel, because our main job is to draw people to Jesus Christ. He says in verse 13, if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are of sound mind, it is for you. 
in our worship of God, we may get ecstatic. I mean, what a glorious God to know him and to know that he died for our sins and we will one day be in his presence face to face. We could go nuts with that with joy. But he says, for your sakes, we're of sound mind. When it comes to being in public, no, we don't, we don't go nuts like that for the sake of the gospel because our job is to persuade people. That's one thing we want to remember when we talk about our faith and talk about what we are all about. The job one of Calvary Evangelical Free Church is to present the gospel of Jesus Christ to draw people. He says draw men. We know that's men and women and children, everybody. To draw them to Jesus Christ. That is job one for the church. And Jesus will always be our message. By the way, concluding that one, uh, our sole task will be to worship God with glory. But to, one day we will do that, but today it is to lead people to him so that on that day they too will worship him in glory. That's our task. And our message is Jesus Christ. Let's not dilute the message. The message is all about Jesus Christ. We cannot in any way, shape, or form leave him out. Verse 14 and 15, For the love of Christ controls us, having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died, and he died for all, so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. That is our gospel. That's our message. We don't have anything more fancy to say than that. Jesus Christ and him crucified. The fact is that God himself came to us in the flesh, the real, the real person of Jesus in history. It really happened. He really performed those miracles, validating this message that we have recorded in Scripture. He really was crucified, and he really did rise again on the third day and ascend into heaven. The Holy Spirit really did come at Pentecost. That's our message. And this message is that because he died for all, we all die in him. And no longer live for ourselves, but to live for him who died and rose on our behalf. That's the Christian faith. We die to ourselves. We live for Christ who died for us. That's Christian life. Now, however that works out, that's how it works out. But that is what it is. If we're not doing that, we're not following Jesus. Die to ourselves. Live for him. That's our gospel. We don't want to uh, start going into sidetracks. The social gospel. Many today say, no, it's all about social things. You can't just have pie in the sky by and by. You have to be involved in the world, making this world a better place. Well, yeah, Jesus did. But that wasn't his gospel. He did that for the sake of the gospel. For his gospel isn't, let's wrong, right all the wrongs in this present world here. That's what the social gospel says. We, the gospel is that we right all the wrongs in this world and make it a better and better and better place. That's not what Jesus preached. His gospel was the saving of individual human souls and making them brand new so that they would be about his business in a more fully powerful and obedient way. So yeah, the social is part of it, but it's not the gospel. We do that because of the gospel. What about justice? Don't we want justice in this world? Oh, absolutely. Should we be fighting for justice? Yes. But it's not the gospel. The gospel is not to right all the wrongs and stop all the oppression in this world. In the first place, the only way that could happen is if every human had a changed heart. That's why it's all about the gospel. That's what really changes the world when human hearts are changed. Should we be about justice? Absolutely. The same way we should be doing all those other things that Paul talked about for the sake of the gospel. What about the uh, ecology, the earth? Isn't that part of it? I was reading, I'm reading a book now, and it's a pretty good book, except it got into this one part where this guy got a little off track on the gospel. He said, you know, the redemption, the Bible teaches... God's redeeming this whole world. It's not just people. So it parts the redemption of the whole world is the gospel, and that involves the redemption of earth. So we need to start living differently and driving less and riding our bikes more and farming in different ways and you know, all those things, which, by the way, are good. I mean, we, as stewards of this earth, as he made us, we should be responsible in how we care for this earth. But it's not the gospel. Whatever we do, we do 
for the sake of the gospel, which is winning human souls one by one into relationship with Jesus Christ so that we might live not for ourselves, but for him who died and rose again from the dead. That's the message we preach. And what we see next is we are called to draw people. Jesus is our message, and Jesus by his spirit makes people new. Oh, look at these verses. These are so awesome. Therefore, from now on, we recognize no one according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him in this way no longer. Okay, what's he saying there? From now on, we don't recognize anybody but the flesh. When people walk in our door, we don't say, ooh, there's an important and influential person. They would be good in our congregation. Or, oh, there's someone who's a good accountant. They'd make a good treasurer. Or, oh, there's a techie. We could put them in charge of the soundboard. Now we're in business. The other side of that would be saying, oh, there's a down outer from the other side of the tracks. Well, okay, well, we'll let that go. No, it says we don't recognize people according to the flesh. We knew Jesus according to the flesh, but we don't know him that way anymore. So how do they recognize people? How should we recognize people if it's not by the flesh? Not by looking and saying, oh, look at that. Nice looking person, nice family, good skill set, good addition to the congregation. Verse 17, now if anyone therefore is in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. That's how we recognize people. Either born again by the Spirit of God or not. We'll read those two verses again. Therefore from now on we recognize no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him this way no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. This, my friends, is what it is to be a Christian. We don't look outwardly at the flesh. We look inwardly at the heart. Being made new, we die with him. We are raised up with him. We are made into new creations by his spirit. Old things have passed away. New things have come. It's that new beginning, a new life, a changed and changing life, which changes everything. A couple of weeks ago, I told a story of a, a true story of a son of a, a famous Christian speaker who was himself a budding up and coming Christian known speaker uh, who left the faith and wrote a book about it, told about it how he journeyed out of evangelicalism, realized it wasn't true. And the most telling thing in the entire book is when he told of what, was, what his faith was all about when he quote-unquote had faith. He said in those teen years, it wasn't, he never really was drawn by the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He was drawn by the quality of fellowship and love and community, and he was drawn by the cause, fighting for a cause. All those things are good, but you know, it was never about the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. What does Paul say? That's the only thing it's about. Becoming a Christian is when the Holy Spirit grips your heart and the veil is taken away, and all of a sudden you see that it is true. This guy is real. He really did die on the cross. He rose again. He's ascended. He's coming again. And this is no joke. It's no fairy tale. It is not only history. It's truth that is powerful and alive today. And we become new creatures and we are changed and changing and we are never the same. And all of a sudden, scripture starts making sense. And all of a sudden, we are drawn into fellowship and drawn into prayer and all these other things. And by the way, imperfectly, we have our side trails that we sometimes get on and need to be corrected with. That's part of not yet being glorified being transformed towards glory, but this is that new creation. Is this something new I'm talking about here? Look back in, into chapter 3 of this letter, 2 Corinthians, verses 15 and 16. It says, But to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their heart, but when a person turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. All of a sudden, it starts to make sense. Let's go from there to uh, chapter 4 verses 4 through 6 of this same letter, where he says, In the case of the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving, so they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is in the image of God. Did you catch that? So that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is in the image of God. That is what we see. 
So he says, we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus as Lord and ourselves as bondservant for Jesus' sake. For God who said, light shall shine into the darkness is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. Amen? We see that. We see the light of the glory of God in the face of Christ. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. This is what he lays out to us. Here's what, here's what Christianity is. Here's what the church is. A group of people whose one goal is to draw people to Christ. Their one message is Jesus, and they have been made new by the Spirit of God through faith in Jesus. Now, when you put it all together, we get, come to the next verses here in chapter 5. Beginning with verse 18. Now these things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, namely that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. This, my friends, is the gospel. This is our message. This is the only real message we have. All the social stuff, which is important, all the justice stuff, which is important, even all the ecology stuff, which has its importance, is only there for the sake of this. The sole goal of that is to make this message connect with people on this planet. Because if they are drawn to Christ, they are made brand new. Old things die, new things come, their heart is changed. They can see scripture as it is, they can see the glory of God as he is, and we are now being transformed from glory to glory until that day when we're fully glorified. This is the gospel. Chapter six, I'm just gonna go into a couple verses. Working together with him, we also urge you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, at the acceptable time I listened to you, on the day of salvation I helped you. Behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. There is likely some of you in this building who are here because parents want you to be here, who are here because it's kind of the thing to do, going to church, and this is kind of a cool church to go to. Got nice people, good things going on, good programs going on, who have not tasted the glory of God. Your lives have not been transformed by the presence of Jesus Christ infiltrating them by his spirit. And by the way, when that happens, you know. Things change. Not always the first day. Some people have dramatic conversions where just the peace of God overflows them like a tidal wave. Some are like me that we believe, and then about three months down the road, we realize how much we've been changing in the last three months. But you are changed. This is the gospel. I want no one that attends this church to walk away feeling comfortable with just going to church because it's the thing to do without knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt the Lord Jesus Christ who has entered your life. That person I mentioned earlier that had been speaking and, and an up-and-coming star in Christian circles and then left the faith, never had it. Once you've been introduced to the glory of God in Jesus Christ, how could you ever say, uh, no, thank you, I'm walking away from that? It'd be impossible. But there are many, many, many sitting in churches every Sunday who are there because church is a good thing to do. Good to bring the kids, give them some moral teaching in Sunday school. It's a good place to make business connections, by the way. But have not been transformed and made new by the Spirit of God. That's what our gospel calls for. That's what the true church is. It's those who have been enlivened and changed by the Spirit of God. And I just want to just want to place this in your heart. This is no fancy sermon that's going to draw you emotionally into getting on your knees and praying to Jesus. But if the words I'm saying, which are just what the Bible says, are touching your heart today and you're saying, wow, I'm missing something, please, please, we beg you, do business with God. 
go into his presence. Come and talk to me. That's great. But you know what? You don't even need me. Sometimes that helps. Talk to somebody you know who's a follower of Jesus. But you individually have to get serious with God. And here's something I will promise you. If you open your heart and get serious with God, he will enter in and you will never be the same. It's happened over and over and over and over and over again for thousands of years and will keep on happening until he comes because that is the moment of salvation. And that's what this is all about. When we celebrate this communion, we're remembering the core of the gospel. Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, died for our sins. We remember his body given, his blood shed. I pray that today in taking communion, this will be the time for the first time in some of your lives you have really come into the presence of God and understood exactly what you were doing in receiving Jesus Christ.